Aha. Hello, everyone. Thank you all so much for coming out tonight on this very special um, publication day. And thank you for joining us in this gorgeous library. We love being here working with our Berkeley Public Library partners. Um, and if you'd like to stay informed about all the wonderful events that they have coming up, there's a QR code on the door that you're welcome to scan on your way out to get signed up for their newsletter. Um, now, for tonight's event, my name is Amali and I'm the events director at Books Are Magic, which, if you don't know, is a lovely little independent bookstore just a few blocks from here. We are so excited to have Nell Freudenberger and Julie Orringer with us tonight to celebrate the launch of Nell's latest novel, The Limits. Before we get into all of that, I just have a few logistics to point out for how tonight's event is going to go. First off, we will be doing a hand-raised audience Q&A towards the end of the discussion, so please start thinking of questions to ask and hold on to them. All the books have been pre-signed, but Nell will be around after the talk to personalize your books up at the table where she's currently sitting. We'll let you know where and when to start writing up for that. And finally, if you're joining us virtually on the YouTube live stream, we would love to encourage you to buy a copy of The Limits online using the link in the live stream description. Now, just a little bit about tonight's book. Um, the Limits revolves around two women, the past and current wives of a prominent Manhattan cardiologist. Weaving together the threads of these two women's very different lives, this novel touches on many themes, most prominently class divides amidst the COVID pandemic and climate crises, but also, as Julie wrote in her wonderful blurb, the idea of what happens when we reach our own limits, both in love and in life. Um, can't wait to dive into this very lush novel with these two writers. So now, a little bit about them. Nell Freudenberger is the author of the novels Lost and Wanted, The Newlyweds, and The Dissident, and of the short story collection Lucky Girls, which won the Penn Malaman Award and the Sue Kaufman Prize for First Fiction from the American Academy of Arts and Letters. She's a recipient of numerous awards, including a Guggenheim Fellowship and a Whiting Award, and lives in Brooklyn with her family. As I mentioned earlier, Julie Oringer joins now in conversation tonight. Julie is the author of three award-winning books, the Invisible Bridge, a New York Times bestselling novel, How to Breathe Underwater, a collection of stories, and the, the Flight Portfolio, which is uh, the inspiration for the Netflix series Transatlantic, which first aired in April 2023. She is the winner of the Paris Review's Plimpton Prize and has received fellowships from the Guggenheim Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the McDowell Colony, among others. She also lives in Brooklyn with her husband and children and is at work on a new novel. Okay, that's all for me. Please join me in giving Nell and Julie a very warm welcome. to Books for Magic for sponsoring this event and also uh, to the Brooklyn Public Library, which I think is my favorite institution in the whole world. Um, I, uh, yeah, and that was a great description of the book. I um, never start a novel with a, with a big idea. It's always a story that someone tells me. So in this case, it was a scientist who talked to me about uh, swimming out over a coral reef off of the island of Morea, which is about a half an hour from Tahiti by ferry. And she said she got to the edge of the reef where it dropped off to the deep ocean, and she was looking at just this limitless blue. Um, and she's an experienced diver, but she said that she felt a vertigo that was so strong that her dive buddy had to pull her back as if she had been stepping off a cliff on land. And that was a picture that I couldn't get out of my head, and I knew that I wanted to write about um, a scientist like this woman. Um, but I didn't know where the book was gonna go from there. And by the time I finished, I think I realized that it was a book about the natural world in the grip of climate change and how it um, put pressure on our most intimate relationships. Um, so the novel starts with Natalie, who's a scientist on Morea studying deep water coral. Um, and she's just sent her 15-year-old daughter, Pia, 
back to Manhattan to live with her father, who's a cardiologist. And because it's 2020, he's a cardiologist treating COVID patients. And he has a new younger wife named Kate. Um, Kate's a high school teacher at a Brooklyn city school, and she has a student named Athena who's trying to finish her senior year online while she's also taking care of her toddler and nephew. So uh, the part I'm gonna read, I'm gonna read really briefly, five minutes. Um, is a phone conversation between Natalie and her daughter Pia. Um, and if you have or know any teenagers, you know how hard it is to talk to them even when you're in the same room, much less uh, 6,000 miles away. Tell me your classes again, she asked one day, struggling to get her daughter to talk. Natalie thought Pia's tan was fading, although it was hard to tell from the phone's camera. She was lying on her bed in the apartment Natalie didn't recognize, against pale blue cotton pillows, the kind of innocuous bedding you might select for a teenager you didn't know. I have English literature and history in English, and also the sexual health workshop. French literature, chemistry, economics, and math are in French. I should say that this girl goes to the Lycée Francais in uh, Manhattan. Why history in English, but economics in French? No idea. What do you learn in the sexual health workshop? Oral sex, reusable menstrual products, pornography. <laughs> How useful. <laughs> Truly, Pia said dryly, Zach had to name four types. Four types of pornography? That would have been no problem for him, it, but it was four reusable menstrual products. He only knew two. I don't think I know of any. Oh, and Mandarin. Mandarin is in Mandarin. <laughs> Mandarin. I hate it. Why did you choose it? Dad chose it. Why did you allow him to do that? But Pia was no longer interested. Natalie felt a sort of panic. In a moment, Pia would say that she had to go, and Natalie might not reach her again for three or four days. It was incredible to think that if Stephen's wife wanted to see Pia, she could simply walk into the next room. Behind her daughter's head were the blue pillows, and behind the blue pillows, an empty white wall. Have you decorated your room? No. Have you taken the things from the suitcase? No. I see. Was there a part of her that took pleasure in Pia's failure to adapt? She decided that no, there wasn't. The research station wasn't the right place for Pia, nor was her sister's family, where she would be forced through the ruthless machine of the French school system. It wasn't so terrible to grow up a little before you decided how you wanted to live your life. That first year they'd spent together in Morea, she was five. Stephen was able to join them twice for only a week each time, and so Natalie always felt unkind saying that it was the happiest period of her life. That year, when she finished her work, or as a break if she had to go back to the lab, she would ride her sim along the coast to the Montessori and Tamai near the airport. She would wait outside the gate with the other parents for the children to finish singing their songs, Ah, Le Crocodile, and Torn Torn Petit Moulin, but also some in Tahitian, including one about the crown of thorns starfish, the coral of Oris, a kinoderm, whose devastating effects she was studying at the time. In the song, the sea stars ate the coral, and then they went down to the bottom of the sea and the coral revived, everything in its own time, in a cycle. She loved the idea. But the evidence was against that kind of recovery continuing indefinitely into the Anthropocene. Blissfully unaware of these facts, the children would emerge, taking their backpacks from a row of wooden hooks. The children were Tahitian, French, American, and British, who heard at least three languages as they embraced their parents and caregivers. The fenced play area had swings and a tiny climbing structure shaped like a ship, not a canoe, but a cruise ship with a fin-shaped stabilizer accessible by a ladder, from the top of which you could see the glittering public water of the, the glittering turquoise water of the public beach. She felt like the perfect mother when she picked Pia up from the Montessori, and she wanted to hear all about it. But like most children, Pia wasn't inclined to give a detailed report of her day, and so she always asked the only question that prompted a response, a question she thought she might as well try now. Did anything funny happen today? Pia remembered. Natalie could see it in the half smile, even on the screen. The mouth was Stephen's, but Stephen would never suppress a smile that way. He either smiled or he didn't. Someone ate a bee. 
What? Jacob is his name, I think, or maybe Jules. Was Jacob or Jules' son? It was dead. Why would anyone eat a dead bee? That's what the teacher asked. <laughs> and he thought it would be funny. Boys are quite young at your age. Obviously, Pia said. Oh, and I guess this is also funny. Dad's having a baby. <laughs> This happened to you when you did your first radio things, but did they ever talk to you about mouth noises? Oh, you mean like the plosive? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I always get in trouble for mouth noises. Oh, your mouth noises are great. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> they were non-existent. Um, well, I loved hearing you read that scene because we just get so immediately deep into the relationship uh, between Natalie and Kia. But I'm going to ask you to take a step back now um, and tell us a little bit about your relationship with Morea as a writer and how it gave rise to this book. Um, yeah, it always starts with a person for me. Um, so it was Natalie and uh, I knew that she had to be very far away and I had become really interested in the deep ocean and so I knew that was what she studied um, and the impact of climate change on coral. And it turned out that the island that uh, was sort of an epicenter of coral research in the South Pacific was Morea, which is mostly known as a kind of honeymoon destination. And so what I was picturing before I went was um, the beaches, the white sand beaches that you see with those overwater bungalows that are like the travel and leisure fantasy that you would like go out into the lagoon, which really is that sort of green turquoise color. It looks like there's a filter. Um, but my impression of the island approaching it on the ferry was so different because from the water, it just looks, I, maybe, maybe lots of you have been, but it just looks like a, a mountain rising out of the sea with no beach around it. And uh, the mountain seems as if it's, it's been kind of covered in these like scraps of fabric, all different kinds of green, the most number of greens I've ever seen in one place, almost like velvet. And it just takes your breath away. Um, and. Uh, uh, yeah, and I felt, I guess I felt like everything that I, that happened when I was there changed my perspective as radically as the, for my first visual impression of the island. Um, I went there thinking that I wanted to write about, um, you know, just meet some scientists and see the lab and see what kind of, you know, hopefully one of them would um, cotton on to me and let me watch, you know, what they did all day, just kind of the boring stuff. But when I got there, um, it really seemed like the particular research experiments that they were doing were not the thing. And the most important thing that was happening on the island was um, this total reassessment of what European scientists were doing there. Because so many of the conservation methods that were um, working the best, that were the most powerful, were the indigenous methods that had been there since before European con contact. And so, you know, I was, I was interested in that idea, but I was also really interested in the predicament of these um, European scientists who had, in a lot of cases, given up a lot to, to be in that place. You know, a lot of times they were living separated from spouses and children. Um, they, it's not a lucrative business. It's a beautiful place to be, but you're constantly struggling to get funding and grants if you're that sort of scientist. And... Uh, I think because I'm someone who's often um, done my strongest work when I'm far away from home, I thought, you know, what is it like to know that there's just one place you can do your work? You can't, uh, you know, you can't be in Philadelphia and study um, coral alvoris echinoderms, right? You got you to gotta be there. Um, and, and just to be reckoning kind of in the middle of your life with, like, do I actually have a place here? Do I belong here at all? And so that, I think that is what um, sort of got Natalie started for me. Yeah, so there's that specificity of place, and then there are these micro particularities of place within that place that you write about and that you were thinking about as you were writing the book. Um, and I remember a story that you told me about a newly discovered coral reef in Tahiti um, that you learned about when you were there. Um, I wonder if you wouldn't mind telling us about that very specific place and its connection to um, the way science is practiced both by Europeans and by the indigenous people. Yeah, I mean, discovery is the most loaded word you can use in Oceania because of the, um, the history of, of exploration and, and voyages of discovery, discovering places that the people who lived there had 
uh, discovered long ago. <laughs> and, and, uh, and so right a couple of months before I arrived, all over the international press, there was this discovery of a, um, a rose coral reef, which is just sort of a poetic name that they use for deep water corals. And these are corals that live in the mesophotic zone. So in this case, like between 100 and 250 feet below the surface of the water, as deep as you can go and still have light. And they look like roses because their the plates have evolved to catch as much light as possible. And what was so exciting for, for scientists and for the press was how pristine this reef was. It didn't seem like it had been damaged at all by the things that typically damage shallower reefs like ocean warming and acidification. Um, and uh, so this was reported everywhere. But when I got to Maria and I asked about it, uh, I was lucky enough to meet some um, spear fishers and fishermen because I was staying at the, the lab um, that is owned by UC Berkeley. And there were a bunch of kids there, a bunch of amazing undergraduates who are doing a place-based program of study. So it wasn't traditional science per se. They were trying to learn more about um, the ecology of the Alai Island from people who, who live there. And uh, um, the, so I, I emailed this guy who was the head of the um, Recreational Spear Fishing Association. And I said, you know, I've read about this reef and you know, is this, it, this is, seems like a really exciting uh, discovery. And he was like, who discovered that reef? Uh, <laughs> it was our ancestors who discovered it and they've been spear fishing there for hundreds of years. And if you think about what it means to be a spear fisher, I mean, these guys don't have any uh, dive gear and they're going down and they're, they're seeing something that's, um, at its shallowest point, 100 feet below the water. Um, I met one fisherman who said that his first pair of goggles, he made himself out of the rubber from bicycle tires and the bottoms of two um, glass Coke bottles. And he, you know, MacGyvered them together <laughs> and went diving down there uh, and, you know, and fishing That's um, incredible. over that reef. Um, so. And because you are, you've always been um, so intellectually curious and such a rigorous researcher, it wasn't enough for you just to hear about these stories um, of what was under the water and, and uh, what it looked like and how beautiful it was, but you actually learned to dive yourself, um, which felt like, as we were talking about at the time, completely necessary to the research for this book. But I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about what that was like just to sort of feed my own envy. <laughs> well, you can come. We can, we can do this together. I am, a, I, in the sense of like loving to read dorky stuff, I'm a rigorous researcher, but I'm also a scaredy cat. So like the dawning realization that I, there were a lot of parts of this book I couldn't write unless I knew how to dive was like, I kept thinking, well, maybe it's not necessary. Like a snorkel would probably be fine, but like <laughs> I really did need to do it. And it was wonderful. Um, I was, I was really nervous at first, but, um, on the first dive I did for the training, I thought that what that scientist had described to me about the reef dropping off was something that only an advanced diver would see. And I guess if some of you dive, you know that this is pretty common. And on the first dive I went on, I, I had exactly that experience where I um, was going along the reef and then I saw that I could just you know, swim out. And it does feel a little bit like you're gonna fall. I mean, your, your brain is telling you that that's not possible, but um, that's the way it feels. And I was so, I expected to be excited about the fish and the fish were, were beautiful, but the thing that really got me were these sponges. There were sponges that looked like um, like a vase, like a vase that's maybe like six feet tall sitting on the, on the surface of the, the reef and they were bright yellow or bright purple. Um, and they, I don't know what, they were really moving to me. I know this is sound like the weirdest thing, but I felt kind of like I was tearing up a little bit. And I think it was this idea that they were kind of like aliens, like it was sort of like meeting a life form that was just as different as possible um, from us. Um, and after that, just reading about the kinds of sponges that exist in the deep ocean, I learned that um, the oldest organism in the world that's ever been discovered is a deep water sponge and they can be up to 11,000 years old. So in the deep ocean, there are coral that are, um, you know, that were alive at the time of the pharaohs and there are these sponges that are from the last ice age. And these, yeah, these organisms are so precious because they're, um, you know, it, it, it is like another planet down there. And we've, it's been, it's inaccessibility, like the pressure, the darkness and the cold has, it's made it the one place on earth that's still protected. 
they say that the diversity, the biodiversity down there is comparable to an Amazon rainforest, and that's like an Amazon rainforest that we've never touched. Which is not to say that we won't touch it at some point. Um, and that's one of the ecological threats that the book hints at. Um, and maybe we can talk a little bit about that. Um, I want you to tell us a bit about deep sea mining and how it figures into the book um, and how it poses a threat to the kind of you know, unbelievably beautiful and alien seeming organisms you're describing. Um, yeah, I talked about this for a long time and I don't want to be boring, but um, so this wasn't something I knew about before I started doing the research for the book. But in on the abyssal plains, I love the names for the deep ocean. There are like Hadal trenches that are named after Hades, and there are these abyssal plains. Um, there are these things um, called polymetallic nodules, and they look like potatoes, and they're full of the, exactly the metals and minerals that we need for um, cell phones and electric vehicle batteries: cobalt, copper, manganese, rare earths. Um, and so naturally, there are these companies, um, they have amazing names. There's one in Canada that until recently was called Deep Green, uh, and they've recently changed it to the metals company because maybe that was too hypocritical even for a mining company. But the idea is that they're going to take these huge machines and go down there and scoop up the polymetallic nodules. Um, but that means, of course, that everything else would get scooped up with it. And they say, the scientists say that every time they take a submersible down into the deep ocean, they find new species. There was recently a mission off the coast of Chile um, to an underwater mountain that is four times as tall as the tallest building in the world. Uh, and um, they say that they think that they've identified 100 new species from that, um, from that mission alone. Yeah, I was reading about these composite organisms that are, that are like these colonies of different organisms, yeah. none of which could survive on their own, but that they sort of group together into a sort of like shaggy star looking co-organism that survives by just sort of reaching around together. Well, and even if, like, so there are, some, there are some officials in the International Seabed Authority, which is the body that's responsible for giving licenses to these fledgling mining companies. And there's, I've heard, I heard one guy say, you know, it's all these scientists, and they've studied one little worm for their whole life, and now they want to, you know, protect it, but we really need these metals. But of course, there are a whole bunch of, uh, well, first of all, battery technology is evolving so fast that there's no guarantee that these are actually the metals that we're going to need. Um, but there, and there's tons of other options, like urban mining, where you go to everyone's basement and get those like seven laptops that you don't know what you're going to do with and recycle those. Um, but, uh, you know, there's also, there's also the disruption that happened. It's so cold down there, and it's so quiet, and there's so much pressure that um, exploratory missions that are 20 years old, you can still see the tracks of the vehicles in the sand. Nothing changes. It's just static. So anything that happens down there is kind of permanent, mm -hmm. right? So it just, it seems like this moment when, um, this moment when, you know, we have a chance to, to save this kind of magical place that's, that hasn't been touched. And so I think, you know, it's like, it, it, when, I, it, when I went there, I thought, you know, the thing that my angry young man in the novel, whose name is Rafi, who's a Tahitian, uh, who, man who, a young man who works for the scientists at the lab, uh, but has sort of his own ideas about what is happening there. Um, I first thought that he was someone who would be interested in independence. It was sort of like an anti-colonial feeling. Um, because when I went to the island, I really thought I'm going to a post-colonial society. Um, and in fact, you know, I went, I was going to a colony, and still, French Polynesia is still very much a part of France, and there's a lot of anger about that. But the issue that was much more prevalent than independence was, was this, the idea that once again, Westerners were going to come in and take um, something that was precious. Yeah, sort of tangentially uh, related to that, but um, certainly intimately connected in some ways, the idea of science as um, the metaphorical lens to which we understand the characters' relationships here and the politics that surround them. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about this within the context of the novel, um, especially for Natalie, who's in that environment. How, how does the science she's conducting reflect her emotional reality, um, and how does it help to illuminate uh, her relationship to the place where she's working, and then by extension to the family that she's connected to by the kind of digital and, and, 
and emotional thread that we see in the section that you read at the very beginning of this talk. Yeah, I, um, you know, the, in the last sample, I, I was kind of resisting the ideas of science as metaphor, and um, and that was true of the, the main character of that book. She was a physicist, and she hated the way that um, physics was used in the popular imagination, this idea that, like, because Heisenberg came up with an uncertainty principle, like, everything's crazy, and you can never count on anything, you know? <laughs> she didn't like science being used in that way. But I found the physics just totally irresistible, metaphorically, and it did end up working that way in the book. And I thought biology might be like that in in this book, but it really um, the the when I got there, it was it was much more this kind of this sort of um, paradoxical feeling that people had about um, you know kind of wanting independence, but knowing that that separating from France would be financially um, devastating for the islands. Um, and the, the anger um, was apparent, especially in young men I talked to. I, had, I met this um, lovely man who runs a tourism business um, in Moria, and he took me out for coffee in a, a kind of French pastry, outdoor French pastry shop, and he kind of leaned in and he said, look around at these people. They're civil servants and they're teachers and these are, you know, people from mainland France. And he said they're they're paid three times what we're paid for the same jobs, and they don't pay taxes here. Um, so it was it, it was that sort of. Um, he he loved to swim, and every morning he would go out to the lagoon to take a swim, and it was really like one of the ways he connected to his um, home. And he he said, you know, the scientists are my friends. Like I really like a lot of these people. But he said sometimes I find discarded scientific equipment when I'm swimming in the morning, and it makes me crazy. You know, I can't believe that they can't remove what they've used once once they're finished. So was, you know, there were a couple, um, yeah, there were a couple of young people I talked to like that, and that really um, kind of got me started with Raffi and how he would think about um, all of it. Yeah, well, those kinds of um, those kinds of social tensions that express themselves both on the larger scale and intimately are um, present both in the Moraya setting of the book and in New York um, in the novel. And I wonder if you can talk now a little bit about the New York-based characters. Um, Stephen, a cardiologist, is privileged, intelligent, a super hard worker. Um, he hasn't faced many times when he's out of control. But the novel is set during the pandemic at a time when um, his experience has become completely different and he's, he's facing a total loss of control in his work. Um, and at the same time, uh, his new wife is pregnant. Um, and I would love for you to um, illuminate a little bit about your, uh, your research into uh, what was happening for medical workers during the pandemic, um, that, that kind of very particular and fraught pocket of New York life during that time. Um, okay, well, I won't embarrass her too much, but my main research research source for um, COVID medicine is sitting over there. She hates to be called heroic, so I won't, I won't do it, although I don't know another word for it. Um, but she was working at a hospital that was uh, much less well-funded than the one where Stephen works. There was a real problem with getting enough PPE. And um, she told me a story about coming home one day and her husband asking her how, you know, how did it go today? And she said, I did one useful thing and it was finding a phone charger for a patient who uh, really wanted to FaceTime with his family. Um, and she was an infectious disease doctor, you know, not, not a cardiologist who had been shunted into this kind of care. Um, so that, um, Stephen, yeah, Stephen, to me was someone who, um, not a bad guy, but just someone who had, no, nothing had really been hard for him um, until this, and he's really thrown by it. And it, um, because he's so worried about passing germs to his wife at the very beginning of the pandemic, who is pregnant, he starts kind of shutting down with her a little bit emotionally. He doesn't tell her about some of the stuff that he's seeing in the hospital because he sort of feels like if he doesn't talk to her about it, there'll be a place where it's not happening. Um, but, in, but he needs to talk to someone, so he starts emailing his ex-wife. And I, um, I don't know, you know, it's, it wasn't something that I necessarily heard from anyone, but um, sometimes these connections with people that you weren't in touch with got stronger during that time, or maybe you, you know, became closer to someone because you ended up quarantining with them or in a pod with them. So I was sort of getting at that. I also really love writing letters, and I think the like epistolary novel is obviously like a 
a tricky form these days that we, like young people don't remember what letters <laughs> even are. <laughs> um, but I still have a great time writing um, emails back and forth between people. I think that the, um, when I first graduated from college, I sort of, I knew I wanted to be a writer, but I didn't like, think it would ever really happen. And I was teaching English in Bangkok and we used to, we were still writing home at that time because we didn't have an email connection where we worked. and. Um, there was this there was this German bakery near the school where I worked, and it, sort of near. You had to take a bus. They had this big yellow international phone that was like attached to the wall. I'd go every couple of weeks and tell my parents that I was still alive. But the um, the majority of the most of the way I communicated was on these blue aerograms that I don't know if anyone remembers. That was like really thin paper, and you fold them up and then address them. Um, and I think I learned this lesson during that year about writing. When you're a, in college and you want to be a writer, you take these creative writing classes and you're trying to write something that's beautiful, or you're, usually you're not trying to write something that's funny, although that's probably what you should be doing. Um, but you, it's hard to picture having a reader if you don't believe you're going to have readers, right? And writing these letters was the first time that I I thought to myself, oh God, there's someone on the other end and I have to make them laugh. And I have to make them want to like turn it over and read the other side. And I think it was better training than anything I did in uh, creative writing classes. Speaking of which, <laughs> I'd love to talk about Kate, um, Stephen's wife, and her experience teaching writing and English literature in New York City schools during the pandemic. Um, her job is so difficult because she is the conduit for a lot of these kids between you know, the life we led before where they were sort of really full-time students and the lives they're living now where so many of them have to work hard on behalf of just keeping their family lives running. Um, and I'd love to, uh, the question that I have uh, really has to do with um, how you were learning about her particular struggle and what your relationship was like with kids um, in the New York City public schools because I know that you've worked um, for a long time as um, a pen writer in the schools. Um, well, I'll just give a shout out for pen writers in the schools if there are writers here who are interested in um, hanging out in high schools and helping with college essays. It's the, one of the most fun things that I do. I was talking to another, uh, I was talking to a, a real teacher um, on the soccer field the other day, and I said I really love going into this school, but it's nothing, you know, I, I have so much admiration for the teachers who do it every day from 8.30 to 3.30, and she said, yeah, we're like parents and you're like a grandparent. <laughs> uh, it's a good, it's a good analogy, and I think, you know, um, I love going, and it was, of course, it was always in person, and then when the pandemic happened, we were suddenly uh, using Zoom and sort of in each other's homes, and there'd be, um, a lot of kids took extra jobs during that time because you had time during the day, so maybe you're working with somebody who's like making a smoothie at Jamba Juice, or maybe somebody's really tired because they were delivering cookies for insomnia the night before or whatever, but then there were all these young women who were doing childcare because if your parents are working and daycare is closed, it's going to be a young woman who's tapped to take care of younger family members who don't have any place to, to go. And um, I had, I became, well, I was, I was thinking of one young woman who had her camera off and sometimes I would sort of gently ask if they were comfortable turning their cameras on because you haven't seen these students ever um, and it'd just be nice to kind of like put a, a face with a voice. And she said, oh, I would, but my hands are so soapy because I'm giving the baby a bath. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, you know, like if you bathe an infant, an infant is the slipperiest thing, you know, that on earth, <laughs> there's nothing more slippery, right? And to try to like dictate a college essay while you're doing that is really impressive. Um, and then I worked with another student who really impressed me. Her nephew was, um, was often in the frame and she was doing a lot of caregiving for him and he always wore a Spider-Man suit. Uh, and one day, she, the Spider-Man suit was half on, and I watched her while she was talking to me, without looking, just undo the pull-up. You know, there are those pull-ups that like you can tear off on the side, quickly take it off without taking off the suit and put on another one. And I was like, that is something I did not learn to do until I was in my early 30s. And I have to say that the care that I watched young people give was not just the basics, it was like, creative game playing and there was so much love and I just was amazed that on top of all the other stresses I was watching young women do this and I wanted to um, try to like honor that in the book. Well
Well, in addition to writing so incredibly subtly and beautifully about that, um, and with so much personal knowledge, um, I also love the fact that instead of just writing about teenagers, you're also writing from the point of view of a teenager in this novel, of teenagers in this novel. And I really would love to um, to hear you just tell us a little bit about how that came to be, because I know that wasn't your plan when you started the book. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm grateful that my teenager is at soccer practice, so she can't correct me on any of this. Um, but yeah, I had this teenager, this other teenager, there are two of them in the book. Athena is the one who's taking care of her nephew, and then Pia is the one who's just come from the South Pacific to Manhattan. And I thought, you know, Pia didn't interest me as much at the beginning, and I wasn't sure she was going to tell any part of the story. And then um, once I went to Morea, I and I learned a little bit about the history of nuclear testing in that area. Um, I felt like that was it was still so it was still such a force in uh, Tahiti and the surrounding islands. Um, I didn't know that France had tested nuclear weapons in uh, French Polynesia until the late 90s, until I believe 1996. Um, that fact kind of knocked me sideways when I learned. And then I really knew very little about um, American nuclear testing in the Marshall Islands. And so with Pia, I had made this, you know, this angry teenager. She's got a lot of free-floating anger. She doesn't have too much to be angry about. She's not a lot is being asked of her. She's just meant to do her schoolwork. She has this nice apartment to live in. But her dad is pretty absent. He's always at the hospital. And her mom is 6,000 miles away, and she's not crazy about her stepmom. And, uh, and so she, some of her anger gets kind of sh shunted into this like research that she's doing, which is really just looking around on Wikipedia. And she, she makes lists. She, she writes in her journal, but she doesn't write a, a narrative. Sometimes she writes dialogue. She's kind of a budding actress, and so she likes to write about conversations that she's had and write their, um, a script. And then sometimes she writes in the language of kind of text messages. And then sometimes she just copies this stuff that she's learning. And she has you know, crush on this this guy, Raffi, who helps her mother at the lab. She's really pissed about leaving Maria because she's in love. And um, he's much older than she is and totally inappropriate, and that makes her even more crazy about him. <laughs> um, and so she starts, you know, cataloging these nuclear tests, and it was, a, it was a way for me to kind of have that information in the book and also to get at the sort of... Um, powerlessness you feel when you see, uh, you know, 20 tests in, in five years that you've never learned about. Pia, Pia talks about um, SpongeBob, SpongeBob SquarePants and little kids laughing at SpongeBob SquarePants. But um, SpongeBob lives, you might know, in Bikini Bottom, which is the island of Bikini where the, some of the first tests took place. And some of the characters wear hazmat suits. And there's nothing living there. It's all, it's all dead. Um, and you know you can watch a lot of SpongeBob without thinking about where that idea came from. So Pia's journal was a place to put all of these kind of disparate things and see how they like reacted with each other. I love that, um, and I have so many more questions for you, but I know I'm not the only one. Mm -hmm. So now um, I'm going to turn it over to you, um, and uh, if you would raise your hand, um, I think we're going to come around with a microphone um, and mic your questions. Um, so this is your opportunity to ask Nell a question about this beautiful book. One second. Wireless mic. If anybody has a question before we get the mic, oh, we got it, okay. All right, no, if someone has a question, can speak up while we Oh, okay. If anybody Sorry has a question that. before the mic's worked out, raise your oh, hand and ask. Here we go. Okay. Perfect timing. Apologies again. Okay. Questions? Anyone? There's got to be at least one. Here's one. started to talk about this, and I wanted to hear more, so I'm going to ask you something you sort of alluded to already, which is how are physics and biology different to write about, and how do they act differently in your different stories? I know they're very different novels, but how, how are they as a writer deal with different? Um, 
So physics is so abstract, and I never learned enough math to really understand it, anything that I was studying on a mathematical level. But um, I find it so exciting. I used to say when I was doing the events for that book that um, science, physics was like a, another country that I could visit without leaving home. Uh, a lot of my earlier work was really inspired by the time I'd spent in other places, but when you have kids, you can't go to India and backpack for three months or teach English in Bangkok or whatever it is. Um, and physics felt like this like place I could go that was totally fascinating. And it, like, I, it had this metaphorical resonance. Everything I read about seemed like it kind of like mapped onto the characters in the book. Um, but it's all, it's all air, right? It's just you can't see physics. Um, and biology, I was kind of relieved, I thought, well, this is gonna be a lot easier because I can look at what they're doing. And in some ways it was, you know, you went into, we went into this like little tiny room in the lab. I should say that this lab, Creo on Morea, is must be the most beautiful science lab in the world. It's right at the um, base of the Apanahu Bay and uh, all around, which is this incredibly gorgeous, like narrow bay at the top of the island. And then there are these, um, you know, the previous lab director loved local flowers, so there's flowers everywhere in the lab, and then all around it are these incredible mountains. So it's flat, but then the mountains just, because they're lava, they're lava formations, they just shoot up around you. So it's so gorgeous there. Um, and, and, but then you'd go into a little room and they would be doing something like taking blood from fish. And actually you can take a tiny um, damsel fish and take a syringe and take it out of the water and draw the blood and put it back in the water. And it's amazing to see them do it. I don't know, they have such great eye-hand coordination. But there was nothing about that that made me want to, I don't know, like um, make it a theme of the book. I actually found the biology kind of boring. Um, and it was so siloed, you know, everyone's experiment was separate from everyone else's experiment. Um, it was so much more interesting to think about the way that the, um, all the different stakeholders on the island, the tour operators and the fishermen and the kind of cultural preservationists, the government ministers and these Western scientists, how they were all kind of jockeying for the same pot of resources. And so the book really went um, more in that direction than the science. Hello. Um, so my question is, uh, how in writing this book, I mean, you're in the experience while it's happening, so you have your own personal, you know, anecdotes as well as the people you've spoken to to help you write this. How Those people were super important. <laughs> 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 um, how has the space in which you were writing, like whether it be your desk at home, be? different from like maybe going to like a coffee shop or how has the setting of where you are affected the way you wrote this book in a way that's different from the other books you've written? That is such a great question. Um, and that there are so many writers in the room and I think they would all have a different answer. Um, for me, I really like to be somewhere quiet and private. I like to wear like not clothes that I would go out in in public, and I like to sit like in weird ways with my knees up and stuff. I don't, in a coffee shop, I'm too self conscious. I feel like you know I'm noticing who's walking in. And I feel like maybe somebody's looking over at me. Maybe I've taken too much space, or I'm not supposed to sit there with my laptop or whatever it is. I, it doesn't matter what space it is for me, but I like to be alone, I guess, while I'm writing. And that's been true for all the books. Um, but the places where I've gone that have um, inspired the books have have kind of stayed with me. One of the things that um, makes it easier, I think, for me to write about something that takes place somewhere else, and it doesn't have to be Morea, it could be you know Los Angeles or, or Philadelphia or whatever, whatever, but it's that when you go somewhere for a certain amount of time, your experience is limited. It has, you know, you remember certain things and there's nothing else. You can't walk out to the coffee shop and notice that um, your block has been torn up and there's gonna be a new building there. Nothing changes, and so you can kind of manipulate those pieces to make, um, to make a story and, and it feels uh, like like the the place you're writing about is is already kind of in a book, right? It's kind of finite um, as opposed to, I find it really hard to write about Brooklyn or you know, wherever it is uh, that's, that I go most often. Um, hi, first I just wanted to say how much I enjoyed this. It was just ultra sensory. I felt like I was going all these different places. So Thank you so much. I'm really excited to, um, to, to read this. 
So one of the questions I had, I'll just be frank, I am a classics scholar and I have this thing where I always say kind of this really pretentious way. When people ask what books I like, I say, uh, you know, Aeschylus and <laughs> Ovid, people like that. I don't, you know, contemporary to me is the Enlightenment. Um, <laughs> one, of those, one of those people who was most helpful to me is an anthropologist at the University of Hawaii, and he has the same, he's an anthropologist, but he has the same reading taste that you have. And he's, you know, it's like, well, I'm learning. Um, classical Greek, so I can reread the Iliad, and I was like, well, I just read Demon Copperhead, and it was really good. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, part of the reason that's intensified in the last several years is I just don't want to know about anything going on. So that's one part of it, and then simultaneously, it's also been that I felt like, oh, wow, like another book about sort of, let's face it, like kind of white people in New York City, and they're depressed, and their relationships aren't going very well, and Nothing's really described even. You kind of don't even really know what they look like. You just, I feel like I went to school with them. I probably did. And like, <laughs> this is so incredible to me because you're writing about place and it feels like I'm kind of shocked by it. So I'm sort of, um, it makes me feel like I need to step out and kind of reassess what I think is possible for writing now. And I think one of the things I'm curious about is uh, it's a very cliche question, but sort of what are your literary influences and what enabled you to make this kind of um, move? I mean, I'm just like searching in my mind for any analogy, and the only one I can think of is Balzac, which just shows you how uncool I am. <laughs> well, I wish I could say that Balzac was my literary influence. I, the person I was thinking of, actually, when you were talking before that, was Grace Paley, um, who often says, like, New York, it's been described enough, um, <laughs> which I love. But I also, um, New York, to me, feels very much like a Grace Paley story sometimes. I love those stories about the park, about women in the park, day after day after day, taking care of children, but also talking about the things that are most important to them. So she was huge for me. A lot of times in short story writers, I also love Alice Munro. Um, I love Middle March. That's maybe my favorite novel of all time. So inching back towards your your time period, um, I love Anna Karenina. I was thinking um, a little bit about limits. You know, the title limits, like which came from these very concrete things, like the number of degrees of warming the planet can sustain, how deep you know you can dive with different certifications. But then also I was thinking about this question that I had when I was young and just kind of starting to think about like, could I write a novel? Like, is it possible? And the novels that I loved were these 19th century novels that really depended on um, rules, right? On the social rules of the society where they took place. And a lot of times it was about women transgressing, like Dorothea Brooke breaking the rules or Anna Karenina breaking the rules. Um, and I thought, what are those rules in contemporary society? Is it possible to write a novel that without, um, you know, where there's not one set of rules and and in this book at least I was thinking well now like the natural world is making the rules for us right like we are limitless greed is has now prompted our environment to to put limits on us whether it's the pandemic or a species die off or um, you know forest fires or whatever it is yeah it feels very exciting so thanks for I think it's funny. I don't want to sound pretentious saying that, but I do think it's brave. It sounds pretentious. <laughs> one of the things I, I see too is I feel like, I mean, there was um, a writer that I was interviewing a couple of years ago, and I won't say who it is because she's a white woman, and she took, was talking about this book that she wanted to write, and then she decided, no, 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 I can't write this book because like I wouldn't be allowed to because I'm not supposed to write about that. And I like the sense that you're just kind of... Well, I'm, so, I, I don't know. I would say that I'm, I'm definitely not, I'm not in the camp of like, you can write anything, but I also worry That's about, a <laughs> right. But I, but I also worry about books that um, can only have one type of person in them because the author is one type of person. And I don't know if I pull it off in, in this book, but there are writers who do that, who I really, really admire. Um, Susan Street is one of them. I don't know if anyone read Mecca, but that's an incredible book that strays quite far from the author's um, own demographic. And, um, and the, the world would be a lot poorer without it. Um, so yeah, I guess I think, when I think about it, I think like, okay, to inhabit someone's perspective, like Alexander Chi has a great list about this. And it's like, how many friends from this group do you have? How many books on your shelf are by writers from this group? And it just sort of a list of, of things. I, I had um, 
somebody say to me, well, but Raffi, like you didn't tell Raffi's story from his point of view and you told Athena's story and you told, you know, Pia's story and why not Raffi? And I didn't tell Raffi's story because I don't have any Tahitian friends and I've, you know, just now read some Tahitian novels and poetry, but I, there's no way that I could, I have to see Raffi from the outside. So that's sort of how I end up making those decisions. Very interesting, thanks. <laughs> Um, so my question is, it sounds like the research is so important to your dramatic decisions in the novel, and I guess I'm wondering, while you're writing, how much are you writing the fiction and then researching as you go versus researching and then planning the fiction in your head or writing notes, or is it kind of like feeding, the whole process is feeding the process? Yeah, that, I think about that all the time. Um, for, if I were writing a piece, when I'm writing a piece of nonfiction, which is not that often, um, I feel like I need to do all the research first. I need, if it's a reported piece, I need to do all the interviews and then I need to make an outline, just like writing an academic paper. Um, but with fiction, it's much more like um, learning something. Like I feel like I have to be learning something that's related to the subject of the book, partly because it just keeps me excited about the writing, but also because it gives me confidence. So, um, you know, a lot of the, most of the science that I learned for the last book or this book doesn't make it into the book, but just knowing it makes me feel like I can write a scientist. It's a way of kind of like allaying the anxiety that comes with writing. And I do it all the way through. I mean, I'm, I'm still writing about deep sea mining because I'm just interested, but it, um, it definitely feeds the work, but it's not a question of like, I need this fact or that fact. I sometimes feel that there's almost like a magic thing that happens though, where you um, find the right thing when you need it, and it might, that must just be your brain doing the organizing, right? Um, finding things that it needs and, and, and figuring out what belongs and what doesn't. If we have time for a couple more, we need the back. So my question kind of follows on the previous one, which is, do you think you'll maintain a relationship with the people that you met and in terms of conservation efforts there, you know, continue to keep an eye on that, that whole world and the news associated with it? I hope so. I mean, there, it's, it really depends on the people though. Like I'm going to um, Cambridge tomorrow and I'm gonna have, uh, I'm gonna meet the, a physicist from MIT who I became close to writing the last book. I know we'll stay in touch. We just had like a very lively email co correspondence. And there's one scientist on Morea. She's so busy and really it's harder to keep up with her because of you know the time difference and WhatsApp. But I think we'll stay in touch. We really connected over, we actually kind of connected over having teenagers right now and anxiety even more than we did over the science. Um, she's amazing, so I hope that she'll be like my conduit to the, um, to that place. Uh, it kind of, it depends on those personal connections. Julie and I talk about this all the time, because there's so much anxiety when you go on a research trip. My first, I went to Maria twice while I was working on the book, and the first time was to write this article for Nautilus magazine. Um, it's really hard to convince magazine editors that you're justified in your request to go to Tahiti, and it took, me, <laughs> it took me about a year to sell this piece, and I'm so grateful to Nautilus. If you don't know it, it's a, it's a general interest science magazine, and it's wonderful. Uh, it's kind of like a scientific literary magazine. Um, I'm so grateful to them for, for sending me. Um, uh, so, um, yeah, I, I think that I think that, that I'll keep in touch with the people that I made those kinds of like personal relationships with. But it's it's um, when you only have eight days, which is about the amount of time that like a parent can take to go away. Um, it's Julie says before I left, I was super nervous about just packing in all the interviews. I was like, I've talked to this person and this person, and they're so, you know, time doesn't work the same way there. People don't keep appointments the way they do in New York. I'm worried I'm not gonna get what I need. And Julie was like, all you need are the email addresses and phone numbers because, <laughs> because you have to make the relationships and then um, from that, the rest of the research comes and that was completely true. You know, I saw the place and then after that it was these kind of conversations that technology makes possible that last through the writing of the book and then hopefully if you're lucky they they last longer. We have time for one more. Yes, exactly. One more question, if there is one. All right, just and just then that's all. Let's <laughs> give these two one last time. Thank you all
for moderating such a wonderful conversation. And thank you, of course, for now for celebrating the talk with us. So, just some final reminders before we wrap up. If you haven't gotten a copy of the book yet, we have plenty of additional copies available for purchase at the table where you checked in. Again, all of the copies of The Limits have been pre-signed, but now we'll be around to personalize your books right up here. We're gonna have y'all line up down this side aisle along the wall and approach the table. Um, my wonderful colleague, Sarah Jane, will be coming around with sticky notes for the personalizations. <laughs> and again, if you haven't gotten a copy, please come see us at that table. We also have some copies of Nell's most recent, or previous novel, Lost and Wanted, and Julie's most recent novel, uh, The Fight Portfolio. So definitely check those out as well. That's all. Let's get these two one last round of applause. Thank you all again for joining us today.